Hello, good afternoon, and good evening, or good morning, depending where you are today at this hour. Um, we're super happy to be hosting this webinar focused on fraud. It is a huge problem, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but we are just really honored to um, be presenting one very interesting case study today that our, our team at NISOS, the analyst team, was able to dig into. Um, so again, we're NISOS, the managed intelligence company. Why are we talking about fraud? As we all know, fraud is a big problem that comes in various forms. It costs organizations and individuals billions of dollars a year and causes reputational harm. So my colleagues and I said to ourselves, this is probably worth investigating. So challenge accepted, let's dig. So today we're going to talk about types of fraud that primarily impact retail and financial sectors. Um, AFP payments fraud and control reports shared that 78% of financial organizations have experienced payment fraud. In 2021 alone, the retail, the National Retail Federation estimated that organize, organized retail crime cost retailers and communities $95 billion. At NISOS, our research and client work spans across a number of different use cases for these industries. So for retail, e-commerce threats and organized retail crime are real challenges. For one large uh, brick and mortar retailer client, we unmask the threat actor behind threatening social media posts, targeting specific retail locations and supported law enforcement intercept of the threat actor who was in close proximity to the target. For our financial clients, anti-money laundering, know your, know your customer and compliance are ever present challenges that require enhanced due diligence. In some cases, we unmask global fraud networks. For one client in particular, we identified multiple threat actors and tracked down the forums and marketplaces that their fraudulent activities were taking place. Today, we're talking about brand impersonation and abuse and one type of payment fraud. I don't need to tell you that these types of fraud impact organizations in both the retail and financial realms. You may know this already because this is a battle that you face every single day. So we hope that the insights that our analyst Vaughn shares with you will help in your fight against fraud. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Sandra Kinkosis. I'm an intelligence advisor at NISOS, um, and I have about 10 years um, open source experience supporting public and private sector clients. And I'm joined by my colleagues. I'll go ahead and introduce, uh, well, I'll let them introduce themselves. So I'll kick it over to Vincis. Um, we'll be awesome. taking questions, by the way, sorry, um, while Vaughn goes over his uh, presentation. So apologize, Vincis, go ahead. Uh, I'm Vincent Chidunas. I've got uh, 20 years of experience in information security and, you know, where it, over and where it overlaps with the space. Uh, principal researcher at NISOS. Great. Thank you. Vaughn? Hi, I'm Vaughn. Um, I'm a senior intelligence analyst here at NISOS. Uh, my background is mainly in counterterrorism uh, in multiple U.S. government agencies. And then I've done a lot of fraud investigation here at NISOS. Um, and like Sandra said, I think there's the Q&A uh, aspect of the, of the chat where you can post questions and they'll answer. And, um, but I, I'll start jumping into our, our discussion about fraud. Um, there we go. So that's a little bit about me, just the introduction that I, I just gave. Um, but what we're gonna talk about today with fraud is um, about how it can be very personal, it can affect businesses, it can affect your life. Um, examples for what we're going through today uh, were actually ones that impacted my family or could have impacted my family specifically. Um, so I rolled up my sleeves during these different case studies that I'll, I'll show you, I investigated, um, but these are the same steps that could apply for financial institutions, retailers, or others who are being posed as or who are being um, defrauded in different ways. I'm gonna go over some, uh, what I found, some key indicators that you can look for to help identify fraud uh, and be able to um, stop it and be able to support um, victims, particularly uh, from the, the standpoint of them interacting with a certain brand or with um, their financial institutions. Uh, as an overview, We'll talk about first the financial fraud case, uh, a, a scam methodology used um, 
to use stolen information and um, affect different victims, and then uh, a brand misrepresentation and abuse uh, process, a separate network. Um, so I'm sure we all know what fraud is, um, but you know it's it hits us every day in our lives, and that's what we really want to hit home is is how aware we have to to be. You know, it becomes a crime when it's a knowing misrepresentation of the truth or a concealment of a material fact, trying to induce another to act to their detri detriment. Um, and we experienced that, you know, like Kevin McAllister committing credit card fraud on his New York adventure, or even finding out that your favorite singing duo uh, wasn't who you thought they were and wasn't uh, the, the singing act that everyone believed. You know, there's so many different types of fraud, and it's become so pervasive that it crosses our mind every time we talk with someone uh, online that we haven't ever met before, every time we think about buying or selling something every time we get a phone call from a number we don't recognize it you know fraud crosses our mind is this a fraud is this a scam is this something i need to be worried about um and it, it hits us in our life with those constant robo calls you know there just feels like they're so obsessed with us trying to get us every way emails chargebacks insurance credentials stealing um, wage fraud and all of us having to live our life as if all of our sensitive information has and probably is sitting out on the web somewhere um, and accessible. So the last thing you want after all of these things hitting you during your daily life and work is to then open up a bank statement or get to work and get an email and realize, you know, you have been a victim of fraud. Um, and so the first example I want to talk about is uh, a financial fraud case. Uh, I identified this initially through um, my mother-in-law who likes to sign up for every email, click on every link, do everything of that nature, um, who was a, a victim of this scam, which brought us into the wider network. And um, and there's actually, based off of the work we've done and, and research we've provided, the FBI has a, an ongoing case into this network where they're making significant leads. Um, but because it's an ongoing case, uh, you will get to enjoy some of my um, art where I have tried to, to remake some of these sites without showing actual screenshots just for the, the preservation of, of the case. Um, but ju that's just a, a heads up there. Um, so what we identified was a network operating thousands of fraudulent online storefronts and individuals who were recruited into a multi-level marketing scheme were registering shell companies that were used to uh, then establish these storefronts. And then the scamming network was using uh, stolen or illegitimately acquired credit cards to make purchases that appeared associated with those online storefronts, although the storefronts were actually not even able to make real transactions. Um, and in the instances when a victim identified and disputed a fraudulent charge, uh, the these websites and shell companies served as evidence of the store's legitimacy, which was why we'll talk a little bit about key indicators, things to look for to get past that kind of facade. Um, and then as well, we'll talk about um, how, how the scam works in, in more detail soon. Uh, but the victims of this are, uh, well, there's multiple levels of victims. There's the individuals who were losing out on the money that was just being stolen through the stolen credentials. There were recruits who were being established to set up the shell companies for the larger scam network, uh, the majority of whom probably really didn't understand the overall thing that they were participating in. And then there were the financial institutions who had to handle chargeback arbitration and who were uh, seen generally as the last line of defense um, for the victims. And so it would put extra pressure on financial institutions because um, the, the resources that they had to put into arbitration and the potential pressure, reputational risk, and potential loss um, was ultimately directed at them when, of course, the scam network would not assist in any type of um, rectification or, or any type of um, assistance. And through what we'll see, there are instances where um, even through the processes of, of arbitration, um, the scam network had figured out how to also drive some of these institutions to incorrect conclusions. So the way that the scam network would work is um, the scam leaders and their, their individuals would do a, a typical MLM recruitment scheme, get individuals who then would feel like they've got a really good deal and they're a part of this affiliate marketing program and they would set up these shell companies 
They'd go to the bank, set up the financial uh, bank accounts associated with those shell companies. And then they would send the credit cards and checking check accounts and different things to the scam, central scam leaders for complete control over that. So if you set up a shell company in the bank account, you then were very hands off from then all out. Uh, different people that we talked to said that they would receive about $500 a month to participate for roughly 20 minutes of work. And all tax documents, all chargeback uh, dealings were handled by that central network. Um, and so the network, the central leaders, once they got the, the shell companies registered, then they would set up fraudulent online storefronts. And that's what the FOS is at the bottom, that they would associate with those shell companies. And um, and in, in the best working of this fraud, the... Um, none of this would be necessary if, if a scam really went as it was supposed to because if you see the victim in in the bottom right corner um you know the the network would use stolen credit card information make purchases that they say are associated with one of these fraudulent online storefronts take the money and in the best case scenario for them the victim would never notice and it's done right but this this backstopping was really helpful for when a victim noticed uh, thought something was up, disputed the claims, and an arbitration process uh, took place regarding the, these these charges. Um, but what the um, the network had set up was a way to provide fraudulent evidence of of purchases. So, in in uh, one of the specific instances, there was these multiple charges that occurred in in November twenty two, um, and so when the victim sought to to initiate the chargeback claim um then the money was given back as you see at the bottom on the right hand corner in green but the victim ultimately lost their arbitration and the money was then taken out again um and as you see the different price points of like 135 139 and 695 um the way that these sites worked is that in the many 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 sites created throughout the scam they contained similar products, uh, similar price points, and like a single LLC, single shell company created by one of the recruits could have, you know, 15 or more um, fake stores associated with that. And they would have similar items and similar price points, but they didn't always match up. So like the first row here, you know, you have a, a stuffed toy for $139. Well, on another site belonging to um, the scam, there would be that same stuffed toy, but it would be the $39.97 price, whereas on the other site, it was the stroller that had been $39.97. So the price points would be sloppily thrown around with the items, but there was usually that consistent uh, number of like $135, $139, $39.97 um, throughout all of these different sites. And so... Um, with one of these victims who requested the the bank information for what the um, the merchant provided as proof that they had actually made a purchase, uh, you'll see as part of the snippet that they claimed the transaction amount was one hundred thirty five dollars, but in the screenshot they provided, you know, there was no shipping information, there's no credit card information. They said that it was an item for $39.97, even though this was actually one of the few sites that didn't have anything for $39.97. Um, and in the discussions and with the ongoing research with, with the Bureau, um, you know, it it seems like the, the network might be taking advantage either of smaller um, financial institutions who may not have the same level of, of arbitration resources and maybe just providing some level of documentation was considered enough. Um, you know, that what they were able to provide on this document was the victim's name, address, and credit card number, which again is something that they would have had if that's what they had stolen. And so at least provided those three points of verification. Um, and what's also rough for the victims in this case is that most of them really don't know about other steps that could be taken. Like when they lose the arbitration, but it um, really was a fraudulent charge, they may not be aware of direct interaction with credit card companies or legal action or different things or um, the scam network was also really good at just trying to wear out the victims until, you know, it's not worth it for them to try and go through a legal process or different routes. Um, so in this process, the way that they were able to do that and create all these sites and gain victims and, and things that you can look for as you go throughout any type of investigative process was 
um, the format for these sites. And um, in particularly, we'll get into a separate case study later where we have specific screenshots that will also show um, like actual examples from a different fraud network that also will be helpful to, to also explain this. But um, they used a template site that allowed for quick creation and implementation that all uh, were pretty generic and mainly one pattern. And what we saw multiple times through was that you'd have these different stores and their store logos. And um, what helped to track it all to a central network is you'd have a completely separate LLC. You'd have a completely separate individual who had registered that company. And yet they would have somehow the logo for one of these other stores. So if one person had registered this LLC for this website and another had registered that, sometimes you'd see a crossover of the um, the logos for those store. Just really clear that it was uh, quickly and, and sloppily made, but still effective enough because again, these were just working as backstopping in case somebody decided to take a look. And, and of course they built all of these by stealing images from legitimate brands pages, um, selling those types of products. And so even searching on images and searching on um, where else that's available on the web can be a significant clue of, okay, this was stolen from Walmart or this was stolen from any type of brand. They're taking that image and using it. Um, so in this way, it really felt like we had just jumped into an infinite pool of um, thousands, hundreds of thousands of these cloned websites that could be easily made and could just go on forever. Um, but I'll touch on a couple more things with this network to look for, um, particularly when investigating fraud networks and, and fake sites. Because um, with this site, what was interesting is, again, it, it appeared on victims' bank statements. It said, oh, you made a, a purchase on, you know, giraffezebra.com. And it would be spelled weird or have some weird hyphens in there. It was clearly not a site that you would ever land on um, naturally. And, but it was one that you could go and you would look and you'd say, okay, it looks like a real store because it exists. Um, but the reality was that the infrastructure was not there for actual um, purchases to be made. And so that was also a, a you know, a very big clue that no, there, um, these aren't real sites, these aren't real stores. And of course, this is part of a wider fraud network. Um, as well, something really helpful to look for is, as you investigate fraud is to look at the addresses for these companies. Uh, we were able to identify the central page, uh, essentially providing instructions for um, individuals who had set up these MLMs, and it instructed them to use virtual mailboxes. It instructed them to send the financial information to the central scam network. Um, and so most of these sites were registered to just virtual mailboxes, usually within UPS or USPS stores. We identified some that people had um, against the direction of the um, individuals at the top. They had registered to their home addresses or even to fictional addresses. And uh, something significant here that helps identify fraud networks as you go throughout um, would be just searching on, on some of these addresses, uh, including addresses you see on this page or claimed return addresses. Uh, just doing basic Google searches, uh, using quotes without quotes, different variations can help reveal um, patterns that individuals are using and claiming. For example, the return address on um, over a thousand of these stores and likely many more um, was one company with three main addresses and that company didn't have any other type of real mention or business um, besides being associated with these types of websites. And so, I mean, that was that's a significant red flag right there. Whereas if you don't feel like you have a, a strong lead in one point, searching for the addresses and seeing what other similar things pop up um, can be very significant and valuable in that way. And then as well, engaging with the customer support can provide strong clues. Um, of if this is a, a fraud or not. Every single of the site, you know, over a thousand, well over a thousand, each had a different phone number, which ultimately led to the same support network. Uh, they were very unwilling to provide even the name of the company that they worked for as the call representatives, or, you know, claimed to be a third party one that answered calls, but they, 
no one was able able to even answer like if I were interested in getting a job at that company at that third party support company what was it called where could I go um, nobody would talk unless you gave them your name and your email address first um, and they all claimed different locations including very standoffish answers or just very different locations about where they were and this is a pattern that we've seen through additional fraud cases we're currently investigating and, and otherwise um, the many different phone numbers leading to the same um, call network it, it can be a big clue. And that that helped us then take it up the ladder even further once we got some more identifying information on this network. Um, and then again, because this one was very insular and hands-on, it, it, it's very hard to crack the code uh, for from different angles. For example, um, speaking with individuals who had been recruited into the process and who had set up shell companies, um, they were very unwilling to speak unless we could give them, you know, tell them who sent us. Um, when all of these people had other legitimate businesses or jobs that they did, those are ones that they had advertised on social media or advertised in their own way um, through different sites. But all of these shell companies that they had that were associated with this larger scam network were not ones that they had proudly talked about online, had, you know, were not associated with them. And that can also be another good indicator um with everything else particularly if you can't get anyone who wants to talk about the process um the there was a specific page on the scam network leaders site the instructions page you're able to find that directed individuals if anyone calls your personal cell phone number you know hang up send it to us let us take care of it so it was very insular um and again the the overarching scam network handled all the documents and administration. And because they did that, then they had figured out the way that they could meet those minimum requirements and be able to um, prove those fraudulent charges. It was very centralized and it was very organized and they had something that they could provide. So the point of this one is, you know, the scam network had identified the minimum requirements to prove a fraudulent transaction and ca were causing victims to lose chargeback arbitration. Um, and, in these instances. And so even just looking and being aware and maintaining awareness of your personal transactions, your families, uh, balancing the checkbook, and then understanding strong indicators of fraud, um, that is um, super important. One of the victims was able to get, after losing a chargeback arbitration, there was, um, we were able to provide significant information and, and the indicators of fraud that helped then correct that. But um, again, if the, the victim doesn't totally understand their other options or isn't able to push, or is again, like an elderly victim who I'm sure are prime targets who may not have the type of resources um, available to them, then it puts that pressure on them, causes them to lose out. Um, and then also makes it hard for the financial institutions because they become that uh, only hope for the, the victim. Um, so now I'm gonna totally, well not totally, but we're gonna shift gears and then talk about um, retail fraud and brand reputation scams that we, uh, that we had identified. And this will provide um, some examples of things to look for, to be aware of and uh, hopefully give some insight to and in, in how we saw customers interacting with these brands um, and these and some fraudulent oh, some imposter sites for these brands. So in this case, Nisos researchers identified a China associated scam network operating likely thousands of fraudulent online stores that pose as major brands and they don't actually provide major purchases. These sites attract victims by offering highly discounted products and formatting their pages and logos with stolen images to look like from the brand's official website. Uh, these websites involved were, um, they used multiple identical Chinese language templates to quickly build these sites. And uh, the site contact information, products, branding were regularly updated. So uh, it could easily confuse somebody, particularly if they go back to the site a few days later where they you know, had been on a, a site posing as one store and they go back a few days later and it looks totally different. Um, it makes it difficult for those interactions and for that process. Um, 
And a lot of these people were sent to these sites mainly through um, social media advertisements. The victims in this type of scan are similar, but the, the people who really take the hit uh, are the brands because we are able to see through different reviews and, um, and processes from the victims who, who explained what had happened that a lot of them still held the, the brand who was being posed as um, ultimately responsible for you know, allowing this type of fraud to happen by not somehow having you know, overpowered the whole system and protected their name. Um, others still believe that the sites were ultimately associated with that brand even after realizing they were scammed. And financial institutions, similarly as, as the other one, have become sometimes a victim's only chance to regain money, which puts the pressure on the banks to take a, a financial loss in order to keep clients happy um, or risk that reputational damage from customers. <clears throat> so this scam network was one that I identified when I was trying to be the cool dad. Um, I was not looking for a scam project to dive into. I was trying to enjoy a weekend and it... Um, just spiraled out from there. So I wanted to find some kind of playset equipment that I could put in my my yard for my kids to play on. And so I just did a basic Google search for, you know, like playground or play sets or whatever. And in March 22, I found um, the site, you know, it had like a really good deal for uh, a play set and different play sets and, you know, kind of raised some red flags, but I'm like, yeah, I'll click on it. I'll see, you know, what, what the deal is here. And it quickly, to me, uh, had some some big red flags here, but um, I noticed one of the email addresses here was this jmservice4 at gmail.com. And so uh, I just kind of threw that around and saw where that, that took me. Um, and I saw, you know, one really helpful thing to do is you're identifying fraud, and especially when you're looking at imposter sites and ones that particularly could rotate to pose as different merchants or uh, to attract victims through different means is um, looking at the page source information. So by looking at the page source, I was able to find that email had been used on this particular site before the, uh, I won't even try and say that, but this one, um, the site URL had previously had that email in its contact page, but you see that the email was now something different and if you look at the bottom right corner of the contact us page, there was also a third email address. And so I just started playing around with all three of those um, and ultimately found some other sites where I was able to see, okay, on some of these other sites, there were these rotations where this site posing as a Lowe's uh, discount store had service at shoptalk.shop um, in there as their contact address. And this site was ShopTalk. Uh, and but in their um, page source information, you could see a previous email address of service at lowsale.shop. And particularly throughout this um, investigation, we were able to see that there were victims who, even by putting some variation of the, the brand's name in their email address, it seemed to really increase the, the validity in individuals' minds by saying, hey, that says low sale. Like, I'm here for low sales. That that works out, that must be real um, because they wouldn't be able to put that name in their address if they weren't actually Lowe's. So throughout these rotations and gaining all these email addresses and looking at past and present um, versions through the page source, through contact information, through different Google searches, we're able to kind of build out, this is a small sample, but we're able to build out a network of these associated companies, these associated email addresses, these different web pages that rotated these different um, these different brand sites. And um, by looking at those indicators, it became really easy to just kind of keep building it out because of, of that use. And a lot of these names um, associated with the Gmail accounts, you know, were likely Chinese names, um, which we'll talk about a little more in just a second about um, further connections there. But it also made it really hard for victims who were trying to reach out and say, hey, I never I never received my purchase. Or in some cases, they would you know, have to spend a lot of money buying a, a big electronic on sale, but then it would come back and um, they would receive like a really cheap wallet or a scarf or something instead. So some people did receive things like that, but when they tried to contact customer service, 
the email address had suddenly disappeared from the page or it had changed or the site didn't look as it used to, which then again, to the victim means, okay, my only hope is now I need to go to my financial institution, which then puts the pressure off of the scammers and onto um, the, the financial institution. And so some of the key indicators that we saw here were kind of similar to before, just the prices didn't make sense, right? The, the When I was looking at the play sets that I was considering or not considering, but just going through this process, you know, there was the prices on these fake sites were pretty amazing, right? Like this is $3.99, whereas on more, you know, reputable brands who sell this type of, of stuff, it was not, you know, it was much, much different. So they, they sell or they claim to sell at a huge discount um, as well. These um, sites, these, these play sets are all made out of different materials and different sizes and different amounts. And yet they all have the same original price. And then they all were reduced to the same sale price, which just isn't very realistic. Um, and then as well, company addresses, like we talked about previously with the other fraud network, you know, they would claim um, to be these known brands and have real places. But for example, the the image on that, like literally that parking lot was claimed as the address for um, some of these companies. And down below, you'll see, you know, there's places that claimed not real home addresses, or they would just claim a Costco address if they're posing as Costco, or even if they weren't posing as Costco, they would put that or a Skechers outlet or even just any person's random home address. And so again, even looking for the patterns in the addresses, doing a search, looking to see how many sites that address appears on can be a significant key indicator to just starting an initial investigation into fraud and understanding, um, you know, particularly if the fraudster is is lazy, it could be, you know, really telling if, if they just keep using the same pieces of information over and over. Um, and then here is, a you know, another thing we saw where, you know, they had incorrect names, like one was labeled as the Sky Fort Elite Wooden Swing Set with that image. And like, as we all have known our whole lives, it's actually called a Lifetime Adventure Tower Swing Set, right? Like, we all know that. And there's a pic, that's the one we ended up with. There's a picture of me enjoying it. Um, but the way that these sites work and why they're created so sloppily is something when you cast a wide net, um, you know, it's it's about casting a wide net and, cons and a consistent net. So having all of these sites is really important. And sometimes that's more important than having like a really strong website because it still works. Um, we were able to identify that these sites in this network were set up using multiple identical Chinese language template sites. So the image on top is what the Chinese language template site looks like. We found four or five URLs for different ones, but all looked exactly the same as that. And then we've translated it on the bottom. But this is what these sites were built off of. Um, and the sites generally had this type of appearance where you would have a, the name and you at, at the top, you'd have some kind of black bar or some colored bar that lets you know about an even better sale than what you're there for, some super big discount on shipping or something. Um, it would give, you know, say you could contact them and it would inc uh, include social media uh, links. But every single one of those links either just redirected to um, either the homepage of that social media site or just refresh the page you are currently on. Um, again, those those can be big clues, just saying they're advertising they have a, a Facebook account. It doesn't even go there. The contact us page, as as this as we watch this over time, as we talked about, the email addresses kept rotating and changing. And ultimately a lot of these sites, they just fell off. They, you know, of course there were still helpful clues in the page source that we could identify, but a lot of them just ultimately took off that information um, and it ended up looking like that for those sites. Um, and as we saw before, and with the other scam and talking about how it's mostly just about creating a wide network of trying to get people to these sites, um, they, they were created quickly and sloppily and they continually rotated. So you'll see this site was supposed to be on the left was supposed to be posing as um, Dick Sporting Goods, but they had left the Lowe's um, logo from the previous iteration of the site 
or the one on the right, that site, settutor.shop, um, what had previously been a Best Buy and the, the Favicon and the copyright remained Best Buy, but it was now saying it was a clearance warehouse. Um, you know, it helps avoid detection. It helps make it possible for individuals to reach out if they um, want to get their money back. Um, and it makes it really frustrating from the, the customer's viewpoint. And so we saw this for lots of major brands, lots of minor brands. This, this network uh, preyed hard on the reputation of these brands. So we got all of all of these ones and continued. And these are just, again, just a handful of examples of, of what we saw throughout this network, which are continually popping up and which are continually um, being rotated through on these different sites. And then as well, we even saw some uh, U.S. government site imposter ones where like um, they were posing as the USPS and um, they had some correct information about the postmaster general, but they had the wrong name and image for the chief information officer. So um, again, it, it really was more about having something versus having something good. And so what, what I want to focus on a little bit is the harm that that does to brand reputation. Um, because you would hope that a potential customer would ultimately just recognize something was off, right? Like, uh, again, most of these sites had really weird names, usually were nothing associated with a brand, not ones that you would really stumble upon naturally. Um, and most of them were brought there through uh, social media advertisements that, you know, advertised, hey, we've got a big target sale on this site and they click the link and they get taken to that weird site. Um, so you would hope that they would recognize those signs. But what we saw was actually a lot of the victims um, would even ad would, would admit, and again, this is after the fact. So, you know, um, but they would say that they had gotten a weird feeling about that site initially, or like it really did seem too good to be true, but the potential sale price was like worth the risk. Like it was such a good potential sale that they were willing to do that. And the problem is um, that's fine and dandy, but then, you know, the moment they realize they get scammed, then it isn't worth the risk to them, right? And then it becomes the brand's problem and the financial institution's problem where um, once they become a victim, you know, they, they feel very differently about that and they want it to be corrected by, um, the larger institutions that they feel are responsible or at least should help without uh, help rectify the situation. Um, and so um, that could really pose um, that threat to, you know, reputation to um, the the capabilities of the financial institutions and, and their role and the expectations. Um, and so by identifying, you know, weird email addresses, weird prices, just weird URL names in general, that can really help victims, um, well, stop before they become victims and can help really identify, hey, this fraud is, is um, like the site is fraudulent. This is not something worth chasing and putting my money in. And so um, that's kind of the, the bottom line with what we saw for that, that as surprising as it was, um, and as obvious as it felt sometimes that these were fraudulent sites, uh, the victim's frustration with the fraud ultimately resulted in a lot of blame, almost equal or sometimes more blame for the, the brands or the financial institutions um, because they felt like they should be the ones who could solve that problem. So there is some good news here. Um, with, with the work that we've done with both of these cases, um, we've been able to unmask some, some bad people and are working with um, some partners who can do something about that. So law enforcement is leaning into these exploits and investigating instances where these scams are enacted. We work closely with the FBI and have shared our assessments to help research these threat actors, including a, a full investigation ongoing into the chargeback fraud network, um, which we're really excited about. and. Um, there's going to be some really positive outcomes there. 
And then investigative action, uh, we were able to identify a US-based individual associated with the retail fraud network that then uh, provides a lot more actionability towards that individual and their participation, as well as insight into the fraud network at large. Um, but of course, circling or breaking into these, these specific networks, you know, there are plenty more out there um, happy to, to take their place and continue on the work. Um, but what we just want to emphasize a, a few last points and then I'll wrap up and I appreciate everybody's time today, but these fraud examples were naturally and easily impacted a single family, whether it was my mother-in-law being one of the people who had their um, stolen information used in that scam network, or me potentially becoming a victim when I was looking at buying a playset, And if, you know, I didn't recognize, I shouldn't go for this really good deal right here because it's probably not true. Um, these were just natural, unfortunately natural things that just crossed my path. Um, and they represent hundreds of financial victims, hundreds of likely unwitting fraud participants and ena enabling that chargeback scam, uh, multiple financial institutions and their arbitration and settlement roles for victims who ultimately see them as the solution that needs to happen. They impersonated and harm major brands' reputations and constitute likely millions of dollars of theft and loss. Um, and then some of the key takeaways that we wanted to leave you with is, um, you know, as, as you're investigating fraud, as you're trying to get your feet on the ground with any of these, these things, just collecting the available information, such as the addresses, phone numbers, um, different claims, even text within um, the, the page that you'll see repeated across all of those many different sites can help just bring up, uh, make it very obvious that an initial search is, um, you know, that, that there's fraud there. You know, if the product prices are too good to be true, they probably are. Verifying if addresses are real or if they're virtual mailboxes could be a big indicator. Interacting with support phone numbers, uh, reviewing documentation provided by suspected fraudulent merchants to financial institutions, um, regularly reviewing personal and business charges, to identify anomalies, to recognize if there has been any type of, of scam. And again, those, those are really easy internally or easy to hope that other people will do them. And so also even just considering uh, customer awareness campaigns, however, to reach a customer base or a potential customer base, particularly as we have Black Friday, we have the holiday season coming up. Um, people will be looking for deals. They'll be expecting deals and they will, there will certainly be deals on um, social media or on these fake sites that, that people will be drawn to these sites. So any type of awareness of helping potential customers recognize if you're going to look for something on our store, this is the only site you'll see that this is where the sales will be. Um, or, you know, if you, if you don't see these certain things, it's not us. Those could be particularly helpful as customers are then looking and expecting, you know, during the holiday season to, to find pages or, or sales of that nature. Um, but that's really the, um, the main uh, points that we wanted to present to you. And so I guess I'll, I'll turn it back to um, Sandra for now. Yeah, thank you so much, Vaughn. That was very interesting. Um, I was writing a few com a few comments on the side here, hoping um, you all can read. So my first comment was um, related to our ability to interact with actors that lead to further clues, right? So in the first case, we were able to get some information, maybe not as much as we wanted by uh, talking to uh, people in the know of a certain operation, right? And the even the fact that some individuals were not willing to disclose some information as a role, like as a sales role is very suspicious, right? Those So even no information in that case is really interesting information for an investigator. Um, I also wanted to highlight that the ability to unmask threat actors, especially if you start, you know, peeling the onion and you identify one person and you're able to attribute that person, it enables legal teams to take action. So we work a lot with different legal teams at different um, 
companies and even independent external legal teams supporting uh, specific clients in the retail industry and banking industry to help them identify individuals of interest so that they could take further action and um, you know, have something that can have a more positive impact on a huge problem a client may be having. So one other thing I wanted to highlight, and I have this question for Vaughn and Vinces, whoever wants to answer. So we've heard a lot about fake reviews. Have you seen in your work fake reviews being utilized to give a website more authenticity? Or is do you see it more often just being a low-hanging fruit? Here's a super messy website, no additional effort put into it to for this kind of, at least for the chargeback instance. Welcome your thoughts on that. So particularly for like the, the chargeback instance, you know, those sites were more... Um, hoping that you never really had to go there, right? You would never suspect because you would never notice the scam. But for other ones, um, reviews can be helpful. And we have seen scams where where there are reviews or like a, a scam I'm looking at now is, is heavily using, I'm paying different pages to write kind of like blog posts about these these fake sites and, and drive traffic. But um, really in particular, partic well, particularly for people looking for good sales or who think that they've kind of stumbled upon the underground best place to buy, you know, discount, whatever brand stuff. Um, it's, it's mainly like those social media ads that people stumble on that can take them right there and, and just kind of boost that legitimacy. Because I, I don't know if there's a, a full awareness out there as, as well that like, you know, almost anybody can buy an ad you know, the fact that somebody is paying for an advertisement doesn't equal legitimacy. Um, and so I think there's a lot of trust put into that system um, without just kind of fully understanding that it's not, you know, a totally safe thing to automatically trust an advertisement. So so yeah, there are reviews. And, and again, like we've seen blog posts and, on different scams and, and others that have... Um, at least that's been an effort that they've tried to boost legitimacy for certain fraudulent sites and then different reviews. But yeah, I, I would say advertisements that link them directly from a social media place also have a significant impact. Awesome. Thank you. Vincent, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh a lot of the, a lot of times, uh, these actors will use uh, these fake reviews to increase their SEO. But uh, their SEO uh, result uh, uh, score, uh, like fun connection. That's bad. Thank you. And when you see these fake reviews, do you see some sort of pattern in terms of grammatical errors, or does it seem pretty legitimate? Are they one sentences, or? Uh, yeah, just any notable observations that would reveal whether or not certain reviews are authentic or not um I, I guess it kind of depends on where the fraud is originating from um some of these u.s based ones where they've had some of these blog articles or or different things they've been written well enough you know but sometimes like on on different reviews or, or different review sites um you know the english isn't super great from the guy claiming to be you know like from central colorado or some things or you know which which could mean many things but like as a consistent pattern um you know that that can usually be telling um just kind of like i think as we're all familiar with when you see um different scammers or like romance scam things you know if, if you're chatting with someone online and they say you know i'm i'm born and raised in texas you know like long long blood but then like there's like kind of a language barrier still in different ways and it just doesn't match the persona like i think i think that happens quite often uh throughout all all scams so that can be an indicator particularly if you have like a larger sample size um than than just a single one uh a couple of years ago there was a popular ghostwriting um fraud scam uh where uh, a company would end up uh, getting um, uh, randomly texted by somebody who would uh, offer them ghostwriting services. Uh, and a lot of these individuals had 
um, books that they had written and had placed on uh, Amazon. And they had this whole ecosystem and there were real people writing um, really bad fiction um, who were also doing side gigs for these uh, uh, people you know, lobbing um, Hail Mary play requests for uh, ghostwriting services. And I suspect that with the advent of um, AI and LLMs, uh, people are gonna make use of less ghostwriting services, but these ghostwriting scammers may end up refocusing their efforts on writing reviews um, because it's, it's having human beings write reviews that vary um, may be a more difficult uh, problem to solve than having uh, an AI write a report for you. Um, but we're kind of keeping an eye on that as, uh, as we go. I, I wanted to know from an investigative standpoint, it seems like pulling on the selectors as you went was the, it was the like um, golden nugget so to speak of, you know, unraveling a larger network. So you would see overlapping, you know, details among different entities online. Would you say that has shown to be a really effective way of investigating um, threat actors involved in fraud? Yeah, just looking through the patterns, like if, if they need to communicate with victims, if that's part of the scam, um, then you usually find some repetition through with different selectors, different email addresses, ad addresses, different phone numbers, potentially, or, or like a consistent call center representing a bunch. But, um, you know, if they're trying not to be detected, if they're trying to pull off a scam and not um, really have any type of interaction, then um, then it may be less helpful in those cases. But but yeah, looking for those those different things that touch on a whole whole bunch uh, of points, for example, like similar templates, similar styles, those could kind of, you know, take a place of, you know, a, an email address that you might see across a whole bunch of sites may not be there, but you may recognize the patterns in those other ways and be able to, to search on that to, to build out the network. Vincent, anything else to add or do you agree? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, on a lot of these sites that couldn't couldn't handle transactions. We had, um, we had, it wasn't even that you couldn't make a purchase. It was, you couldn't even get to the point where you could add things to the shopping. Uh, and it was, wasn't just one site. It was hundreds of these sites. Um, and so, you know, then you start to ask, you know, what other things, what other patterns are, um, are there between these sites that act the same, that fail in the same way? Um, so it, it, yeah, that's the thread to pull and you keep finding the other threads that, that make everything unravel. And my last question is related to the Google Maps view. So we saw that it led to random address, you know, the random addresses that were listed at the bottom of the pages. Um, in some cases were random parking lots or some warehouse related to a different kind of business. Would you say that sometimes that can also reveal who might be behind the operation? Have you found some overlap between individuals you've been able to unmask in one of those random addresses? Yeah, it's certainly something that you have to be very careful of, though, because, you know, like saying, hey, this is our physical store, and then it leads to a parking lot. Like, you know, that's a, that's pretty telling, right? Like, there might be some explanation, but a little straightforward there, whereas like some of the other things that we were seeing were different home addresses associated with some of these, these scam network um, sites. And, you know, the question, first question is, okay, is this a ran like an address chosen at random just so they could put an address into somewhere and this person just has no idea? Or is it actually somebody associated with the scam? Because, um, you know, if I was going to do that, I wouldn't put my home address, right? So, so you definitely don't want to assume anything, you know, like if you see a home address, it doesn't automatically mean this person's involved. Um, in, in the MLM scam, we were able to see that these people with their names and with the shell companies they've set up, some of them who did use their home addresses did actually include their legitimate home addresses. And that was part of the clues that led, but we were able to verify through different means. Um, and, you know, so I, I wouldn't take anything at face value, particularly if, if a home address or, you know, something like that is involved. 
without yeah, takes, different or without additional scrutiny for sure. Yeah, it takes additional vetting. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you all for um, joining us today. Again, if you have any additional questions, uh, please feel free to send us an email at info at nisos.com. It's been a great pleasure, Vaughn. Thank you so much for say sharing your insights. Vince, you too. Um, we hope to catch you next time in a future webinar. So I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Take care.